no intro straight onto the video. Just a note, those who've kept a keen eye on the past four videos in the series, I am planning to cut these videos down to the key points in order to save time and to make this under 30 minutes. I'm actually going to start off with the concept for all ranks and if there's one thing you take away from this video, it's this concept about improvement. Psyche. Now this is completely stolen from a ghost cat who made a 23 minute video on this but used the word mindset instead of psyche. I refer to it as psyche since I like to keep words like mindset associated with mental well-being, motivation, of which you can watch my video on that in the top right. So what is psyche or mindset? Simply put, it's a form of root cause analysis that attempts to understand the driving force behind why players make the choices they do in every fight based upon compositions, ultimates and maps, also denoted in that quite funny acronym that I won't say for monetization reasons. I'll let Egoist Cat give an example of this with double shield against poke dive, specifically with Hanzo. We want him to open the angles slowly with his team, spamming towards the enemy backline heroes to try and kill them or deny their damage. As his team pushes forward, a dive from Shanghai is inevitable, and since he's the squishiest hero on the team, he's likely to be the target. When that dive happens, he needs to be ready for it. We want him to focus on surviving the initial engage by grouping up to get peel from his team, and also to help force out the divers. Once that happens, he can then spread back out and go back to spamming the backline. We can see this is almost exactly what he does. He comes out of spawn and spams towards the backline, helping to deny almost all potential damage from Bap and Zen. Then once he starts to get pressured, he's ready to group with his team to accept healing and peel, then helps repulse the dive and goes back to zoning the backline. We can see that because he's in the correct mindset for the situation, he doesn't hesitate with any of this. The decisions he made, you know, climbing onto the bus, using Sonic on the backline, double jumping to his team, all of that was done automatically because of the mindset he was in. So for another example, say you're playing Brawl against Poke Dive on Kings or First. Brawl wants to either make quick rotations with cover to eventually reach the enemy backline with short sightlines, or to force point with cover to then rush anyone who dare touches. With this psyche or mindset, we can adapt it to each teammate. As May, you may want to wall off an angle on rotation. As Ryan, you want to be the first one in, last one out, to prevent your back line from getting picked off. You also want a hard shield to be less vulnerable to damage or CC, such as Echo Stickies, Discord or Arnonades. As Lucio, you want to speed on rotations with the enemy team might look for a dive, and perhaps scout and pester heroes such as Ball or Tracer before and during the dive. Not doing these could mean that you're in the wrong psyche or in the wrong mindset, and not how we analyse the possible gaps in knowledge just from the board psyche rather than just pointing it out, and not addressing the intentions behind why you're doing what you're doing. A side benefit that Igoist Cat didn't really mention in his video is that by understanding why you made the mistake you did, you're more likely to remember it long term, otherwise called semantic encoding in psychology. The link to a Goist Cat's video on mindset will be linked down below, alongside his follow up video on critical moments. Now with the slightly more rank specific stuff, starting off with bronze and silver. The first and most glaring difference between bronze and silver is obviously the mechanical skill. Now this isn't just for aim, but also setup optimization on PC specifically. A large amount of bronze players use subpar setups that can't even achieve 60 frames per second, and unless your name is EQO, you will struggle with anything less. I'm not a PC player myself, but I can tell you to heavily decrease textures and shadows, decrease resolution, see whether your GPU or CPU is holding your performance back, and look to buy second-hand parts from sites like eBay if you're tight on money. An obvious thing to mention is to make sure that you're not playing on 60Hz when your monitor can produce 120 or higher. It's a super obvious thing to mention, but it's a mistake people unintentionally do for years without checking the refresh rate on their monitor, hence they're just stuck playing at the subpar refresh rate even though their setup can play much higher. And honestly, this should really be everything you need just to get from bronze to silver. Just having good enough mechanics and even having a general FPS background will naturally help you from staying at the very bottom. And I find that players who thrive solely off mechanics have platinum as their upper limit and honestly, positioning shouldn't be your main worry right now. However, I'll also add in two additional factors. The second factor is just making sure that you're aware of the abilities that each hero does and some of the key interactions. It sounds simple, especially if you're not on bronze, but simply knowing that Discord makes you take 25% more damage will naturally help you tone your aggression and vice versa. The third factor is making sure you're aware of map health packs, key chokes and flanks. This can help increase awareness, provide you with more options in terms of where you can go and where fights generally happen. I recommend watching some basic videos on Overwatch terminal to help familiarise yourself with the very basic terms and how they apply to a game of Overwatch. Now onto the difference between silver and gold, arguably the least distinct section in this video. I'll try and focus on tips which are the most mutually exclusive to this rank. First off, your strafing. Two things which lower rank players often do is WS strafing and strafing too quickly. Movement in silver in particular will be disproportionately worse than gold considering that mechanical improvement alone from bronze to silver will be the main focus and not really your movement. His IO stocks detailing these commonly bad habits with some visual examples as well. One of the most common habits amongst lower players is a symptom called WS strafing. WS strafing is simple. 
Instead of moving side to side by pressing the A and D keys, you move forwards and backwards using the W and S keys. This way, you get the instinctive feeling of safety because you aren't standing still, but your aim doesn't deteriorate either. But if you think about it, WS strafing is terrible. Since WS strafing doesn't make aiming any more difficult for you, it also doesn't make it any more difficult for the enemy. So WS strafing in a one-on-one -on -one situation is no more effective than standing still. Another very common issue in lower ranks especially is that their strafe movements are way too quick. The problem is that if you strafe too quickly, you are essentially standing in place, negating any defensive benefits that strafing would provide you. When strafing, aim for a tempo of around 140 beats per minute. Secondly, narrowing and specializing your hero pool. I think this is when you should start to look to play a handful of heroes in a specific role. This should help streamline your game time to improving faster at a select amount of heroes. Thirdly, is the cover and angle usage, specifically on flankers. Angles are good for every hero in the game, but in particular, heroes named flankers such as Tracer don't actually flank at all in silver, whereas there is at least some attempt higher up. Now time for me to interlace my gold, plat, diamond, master and gm video. I hope you enjoy. No intro, straight onto the guides. The first difference between platinum and gold is the sheer amount of heal bots. Now this isn't exclusive to gold and there are plenty of heal bots in platinum, but I don't think that I've ever seen a single support in gold at least attempt to try and get value out of their damage or utility options. Heroes where this occurs the most are with Arna, Moira, Baptiste and or Mercy not utilising the damage boost enough. In order to give more insight on how this works and on how you can min-max your value and supports rather than fully sitting out on an autopilot throughout your game, here's Spyro giving an example of shooting shoot healing on Baptiste. When we see a Baptiste review and I see you heal botting, there's no excuse for that. Whether it's shooting Rhine Shield, whether it's pressuring a Diva on an off angle, whether it's putting a little bit of pressure on a Lucio that's wall riding, I don't give a rip. But there has to be constant pressure put out at all points of time. Now, the key thing with BAP is knowing who to shoot and when to shoot. Because when you have a safe opportunity, that's when your opportunity to shoot is, right? When you don't have a safe opportunity or you have to walk into sniper LOS, if there's a Hanzo pressuring you, whatever, then that's where the pressure is not quite as necessary. Like right now, right now, this is a perfect example of a when you would not peak. This is when you do not put damage pressure out because your team isn't taking space and there's a risk of you getting one shot here or taking unnecessary damage. However, as you round the corner, that's when our shoot, shoot, heal, shoot, shoot, heal, shoot, shoot, heal, that's where the rhythm starts to kick in. The second difference is the amount of face tanking I see in gold, particularly from tank players. This just ends up giving the enemy team ult charge and you'll likely end up wasting cooldowns so you could save for later in the fight. Good examples of this are with Reinhardt spiraling forward for no reason or when Winston stands in front of a Reinhardt which inevitably ends up getting them killed. Here's an example from Sparlow about the first error being made and a few solutions you can do to fix it as well as explaining why these solutions work, particularly with Winston on Navani first point defense. If you can get behind safely or at an angle here, not directly in front of them, which forces, splits the resources and allows your angles in front of them to have more value. The level one monkeys do this, right? Why is this a mistake? Well, one, it's frontline. Two, my team can't see it. Level two monkey does this. Can my team see this kill box? Yes, team can see it, right? This is level two, but why is it not the best? Yeah, you're shooting tanks. You're shooting tanks and you're frontlining. Your team can follow up, but you're still frontlining. This is level three. And I'll do this all the time when I play monkey. I will drop off. I'll see Rhine shield get to about there or here and then jump on and I see and it's all squishies. And then my angle is this way. Their front lines go looking that way. And I set up an angle here. Let them come out and then you can get almost behind them here. The third difference is the stark contrast in mechanical skill. Back in my diamond and platinum difference video, I mentioned the weird increase in mechanical skill between the two ranks, with diamond players often having more mechanical skill than expected in exchange for game sense. And this is also true with platinum and gold players, but it's more so to do with gold players having a lot less mechanical skill than expected, rather than platinum players being cracked at their aim necessarily. Reflexes are also a notable difference between the two ranks, not necessarily awareness, since that's an issue for most ranks in the game, but just the ability to quickly react to what's going on around them. Of course, in order to fix this, doing tryhard FFA or warming up your aim with aim trainers such as Kovacs should help. In particular, doing modes which focus on your human reaction speed to help nurture your reflexes. The fourth difference is simply players not grouping up. In Platinum, players start to grasp the sense of engaging a 6, but it's very common to see players slowly trickle in and stagger themselves for even a couple of minutes, especially on 2CP maps in gold. Here's SVB breaking down the anatomy of a teamfight into three stages, which should help you understand not only why grouping up is so important, but the difference between engaging and simply setting up. Now, the grouping phase is straightforward. This is the time spent waiting for your team to gather into a full 6. At the start of the game, this happens naturally, because you all spawn at the same time in the same place, 
but once fights begin and players start dying at different times, you start having to make sure that you can all find a place to group up safely. The initiation phase is the most broad category, but generally this is the time you spend after you've grouped up and you're looking for a window of opportunity to initiate a fight. Finally, we have the combat phase, where both teams use their abilities and weapons, brawl it out, and inevitably one team comes out on top of the other. The first thing that a lot of you watching this video will comment on is probably the grouping phase, and how your teammates never group up. This is an incredibly common gripe amongst players in all ranks of ladder play, but particularly in the lower ranks, you will see people constantly trickle in and fail to gather together. As you progress through the ranks, you will generally see a natural progression of players starting to group up more. The last difference is just the one comp or one hero ideology. What I mean by this is basically that gold players often don't want to swap off their heroes that get countered or that they're just not performing well on. A gold roadhog could miss every hook he throws out and he'll still play hog for the rest of the round and likely for the rest of his matches. Or alternatively, a junker could get completely zoned out in value when the enemy team runs a pharmacy. Now, you could obviously still play these heroes even when you do get quote unquote hard countered, but you'll just be forced to play a different playstyle. Referring back to my junker example, I do go through more playstyles on Junkrat in my Junkrat guide here, which I'll link in the top right. It's also the debate between playing to improve versus playing to win. For example, if swapping off Zen to go Moira or Brig, heroes that are often more forgiving, then you're obviously not going to improve as Zen, but understanding why you're not improving on the hero you're playing is often the long term solution to getting better at that hero. For instance, if you understand why you're not getting much done on Zen, whether it's your positioning or orb usage, you can use that information to improve your gameplay in the future, rather than instantly locking Zen every match, hoping you'll just win games. Well that's the video, starting off with the most prominent error I've seen, which is the timing of the pressure. In Platinum, I often see a ton of players, especially Tracer players, actually get a good angle onto the enemy team's backline, but often completely mistime their pressure for when their team are pushing in. For instance, let's take an example in Basan Sanctuary. Tracers will often flank coast side all the way onto backline, but will pay no attention to when their team are pushing in. This means that the enemy team can easily clear and deal with the Tracer, since she's the only threat to be dealt with at the time. This leads to Tracer being cleared, forcing her recall, making the fight a 6v5 for the enemy team. This is also pretty common with off tanks. On D.Va, players usually take too much damage before the fight actually begins and start playing too aggressively too early on. Here's an example from a D.Va VOD I did with Spylo, and even though that this is from a higher rank game, the advice definitely still applies and is more prominent in these lower ranks. We're, we're like astonishingly low in HP in this fight. Like, I just want to look at your teammates HP. Full HP, full HP, full HP, Full HP, full HP. And then this is like, you're like the runt of the litter. Like what on earth is going on here? Not to mention also like the very liberal use of Matrix. Like, oh, true. So I didn't even notice that. Graph here, this is a free graph for Zarya. And it's like, now this means that this Zen, like your, your Ryan's going to be under pressure. Your Brig's going to be under extra pressure from their Zen. They're more likely to, uh, you know, land their micro missiles, land their fire strikes. And again, we, you don't have the micro missiles either. So this is actually shockingly mediocre cooldown usage. Conversely, on the complete other end of the spectrum, there's players who take no angle at all and just stack me behind shield thinking they're doing their job. There's often no in between when considering players and Platinum who have no concept of timing their pressure but are actually on a decent angle and players who time their pressure well as they stand behind their main tank but as a result they don't end up contributing much to the team fight and often get out damaged by players who do take angles. And this is super common with Zarya players who are just stuck onto their Reinhardt or just off tank players in general. His scan players often make this crucial mistake as well. Dorado first point is also another great example of this. Most plat players will just group up together and try to push themselves through this narrow choke when they'd actually be safer and dealing more damage if they just took the time to rotate to high ground. Again, you do have multiple options available to you in terms of how aggressive you want to play, and you will see the higher ranked players control this high ground. In fact, when you're attacking Dorado first point, you've probably had a flanker or a hitscan DPS beam you from behind whilst you're sat at choke. The next tip to mention is the, generally speaking, very lazy cooldown management. Common examples would be a Reinhardt wasting his shield before the fight even begins, or a Zarya being unable to bubble her Reinhardt when he pushes up aggressively, or an Ana randomly yeeting her nade and sleep dot into the enemy Reinhardt shield. This isn't to say that these errors don't occur beyond the higher levels, because they certainly do, but for me at least, it's a lot more noticeable in the metal ranks, and especially in Platinum, where players are renowned for going on autopilot in their games, and this is one of those aspects. Even with some of the quote unquote easier heroes, such as Moira, I see a ton of Moiras overuse their heal spray on squishy DPS and waste their fade and orbs constantly. So how do you fix this issue? Well it's primarily just timing. Stop using Zarya bubbles or Arna's abilities or Bap's region burst or Brig's whipshot or most abilities in the game the second you see the enemies pop up on your screen. Wait for when either team engages and you'll gain a ton more value from your respective abilities. The next tip, whilst a bit cliche, is your mental. Now I know that every 
rank in the game is prone to tilting, but from my experience and from what I've seen, diamond players are often more chill than hard stock plat players who are just inches away from escaping their metal ranks. It doesn't help that higher platinum is arguably one of the hardest ranks to climb through due to the density and variety of the players that you'll come across. Even players who do unranked the GMs will acknowledge the pain of climbing past 2900 SR. So, the solution to these mental problems is redirecting the goal from gaining SR to improving as a player, and instead of blaming the system, constructively critiquing your own performance. Here's SVB explaining the fundamental behind keeping a cool head mid-game. But the main issue that people have is that they get the order of events completely the wrong way around. The rating increase will always come after you improve, never before. How do you expect to be rated higher if you never become a better player? People get mad at the rating system because they think it's telling them a lie or they think that they should be higher. Put it in another context. Imagine you really want to be a 200 meter sprinter. Getting mad at the rating system because you don't think that number is right is like getting mad at a stopwatch after you finish last in the race because you don't think the time was right. Sure, maybe the stopwatch is old, maybe it was started too early, and maybe the screen is a little faded, but you still lost the race and the watch is just counting time, so how wrong could it really be? Who should you actually be upset with, the stopwatch or your performance? The penultimate tip between climbing from plat to diamond is the disproportional increase in mechanical skill between the two ranks. So what do I mean by this? Well, obviously as you go up each rank, most players are going to improve mechanically, but in diamond, players often have better than expected mechanical skill at expense of their game sense. Here's SVB explaining the difference. When I returned to diamond with my DPS alt, the first thing that struck me was how good a lot of the players were mechanically speaking. Even in Platinum, you will find certain DPS players who actually have fantastic aim and barely miss shots, but in Diamond, it's even more common. You'll often find Widowmakers who aim like they should be in Masters, or maybe even GM with a slight improvement, and you'll often find Anas who are really scary to come up against and barely miss a sleep dart or are able to pluck fires out the sky. Later in the video, he uses this graph to show the abnormal spike in mechanical skill that diamond players often have. Now, this of course causes a problem with diamond players themselves when referring to the difference between diamond and master players, but if you're platinum playing up against a bunch of diamonds, you may be outclassed just by mechanical differences. So what's the solution? Well, there are multiple. The most obvious one is to improve your mechanics using workshop codes or Kovax or other different methods of mechanical training in order to close a slightly greater than normal mechanical gap. However, this unusual increase in mechanics for diamond players also means that there isn't that large of a gap in terms of game sense. This means that using the other tips prior about being on an angle that's actually timed well with your team and isn't on either end of the extreme will do the most work for you. The first and arguably most important tip when trying to reach masters from diamond is simply choosing just one teammate to work with in your game. And the best part is, is that you don't even have to talk about it, as Shane explains here. Here's like the nine billion IQ to get out of diamond. In diamond, you pick one person on your team it's either going to be the carry or the person who think you think needs the help. And instead of trying to invent some new goal for you to accomplish, help the person on your team accomplish whatever they're trying to accomplish. You don't even have to talk about it. Like, have you looked at your Winston once? Just chill with Winston, poke, and when, when, when your Winston attempts to feed, conveniently assist him in killing him, whatever was going to accomplish his goal of feeding like a moron. This is ever more important when playing in a dive composition, with so many working parts in the team comp, from your background supports, to your tanks actually diving, to the DPS taking well-timed angles when the core goes in. The second tip, being more tailored towards DPS players, is to not force disadvantageous jewels, and to force advantageous jewels wherever possible. I'll break down disadvantageous and advantageous jewels into three major factors. The status of your cooldowns, the amount of HP you have, and the sightlines your hero wants to play. For instance, if you're playing soldier, even if you have full HP and cooldowns, you don't want to be corner peeking against a Widowmaker from 20 miles away. Likewise, playing really close and upfront angles as a sniper up against a hero like Genji or Tracer isn't going to end well for you. Building on this a bit further, when taking hitscan jewels, in particular sniper jewels, his IO stocks going through a number of advantages that you should take and utilize wherever possible when taking a jewel yourself. For example, you get the jump on someone, right? You get the first shot without them noticing you. The advantage could be positional. So for example, if you have high ground, that's a positional advantage. You can you have your ultimate, that's an advantage. You can have someone pocketing you that's an advantage, right? There's also peekers advantage because obviously you know when you peek 
but the enemy doesn't know when you peek, which means that you're gonna have an advantage in terms of reaction time. So if we look at this 1v1, there's two outcomes. Either you use your ultimate here and the enemy Widowmaker doesn't hide, in which case you can peek her and kill her because you have a very, very big advantage. You have peeker's advantage, you have high ground advantage, and you have wall hack advantage. Or she doesn't peek you, which means that for the entire duration of your ultimate, the enemy Widowmaker and the enemy Ash are going to be completely useless. The third tip, being more tailored towards main tank players, especially those who play Reinhardt, is to clear high ground before pushing in, as Spalo explains here. Where is the enemy team really scary? Right here. Because the second that you press W down main, what's going to happen? Where's your shield for Junkrat spam? Who's going to stop Doomfist from just going in and smashing your f support's faces in? You're done. You're done. You're going to W key and you're going to be like, why am I not getting any healing? Well, it's either because your backline is dead or they had heal station, flashbang, on an aid. Nobody's shooting the enemy, Reinhardt. They're all shooting you. Bingo. So the question here is, what can you as Reinhardt do? Now, this is why Reinhardt's a tricky hero to play. He's really, really fundamentally basic, but he's hard to master because you look at the situation here and you're like, okay, well, I have to find out a way to deal with that. You need to clear stairs. Now, obviously, clearing stairs into a junk is going to feel pretty clunky. You might get punched. It's going to feel rough. But I'm less scared because if you go stairs, the enemy Sigma, enemy Ana, enemy Mercy, enemy Rhine, they can't really pincer you. Once you clear high ground, chat, what can Reinhardt do with high ground? Can Reinhardt really do anything with high ground? No, he can't. No, he can't. But your McCree can, your soldier can, and more importantly, this isn't just about enabling your team, it's about in disabling them. If you do nothing else here but make Doomfist reset his cooldowns and make Junkrat go play with his team, you've done a good job. I'll showcase three more examples of Dorado attack, one for each point. Keep in mind that you should ideally do this as a six-man team, especially in a full Lucio bat ball comp, but in ranked, having one or two teammates, such as a Lucio and or a DPS player, should be enough. On first point, you go coast to clear this high ground to get rid of the squishy DPS players. On second point attack, you again go coast side, up the stairs to control the high ground on bridge. Yes, this is a bit unorthodox and I have had teammates yell at me in rank for doing this, but if you just stay on car as Ryan, you're way more likely to get surrounded by angles, and by clearing this high ground, you're allowing your own DPS to use the high ground you just cleared, as Spano explained. On third point attack, you want to path up the right side stairs to again clear any DPS or squishy heroes. It's not too uncommon to encounter a pog to DPS or flex support using these high grounds. The fourth tip is to have aggressive rotational options when you position. This is useful for moving to more aggressive positions during the mid fight in order to get another angle to use your cooldowns. In fact, his Jane showcasing a good example of a master Zen player aggressively rotating to a left side flank on Rialto first point attack. Left flank. Yeah, yeah. yeah good, you got it. Is that really that hard? Soft flank, left side, found an opportunity, unscouted, surprised the Hanzo, had a right click charge, boom. Now, you can either look for a follow up, try and deny the res, or just fuck off. Huge. Right? Playmaker. 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 The, you need to do that shit consistently. You want to get to the point where the opponent is fearful of what window, doorway, crevice, just fucking attic. Your robot ass is gonna float out of and just delete somebody with a right click. You wanna get to the point where you are not being hunted, you are the hunter. You wanna threaten that, you wanna cause people's attention to be drawn off the front line, you want them to invest resources into trying to try and keep track of you. You want them to take different positioning because they keep just getting fucked by you. That was good. I want to see more of that. Here's another example on Rialto third point attack, where you can rotate to either of the left side or right side rooms. And what often happens is that teams who cap Rialto third point often control these areas of the map. Just to add a bit more nuance, heroes that want to play shorter sight lines, for instance, Junkrat or Reaper, or any hero for that matter of fact, if you're playing up against a longer range composition, would want to take the right side flank due to the smaller sight lines that the room provides. No intro, straight onto the video. Starting off with the most significant difference I see between Masters and Grandmaster players, which is the sheer improvement in micro, which is essentially how you use cooldowns, abilities, and tech. For instance, with support players, Briggs often overuse the repair packs when they don't need to, Bat players often misuse their region burst and don't put much thought into using it in mid fight, Diva players often under or overuse their defense matrix and or misuse their micro missiles by tossing them in too early, Ryan players still misuse shield before the fight actually begins as well as during the mid fight, and Tracer players often have mediocre blink management when trying to sustain in prolonged fights. To his sword or W showcasing an example of now former Overwatch League Tracer player Kevstar managing to utilize cover and terrain in order to not waste any of his blinks. Remember how I talked about one and a half, one and a half, one and a half? He's at one and a half. A lot of tracers I know instantly would have double blinked out. They would have blinked from that corner all the way to the choke and been like, all right, like I need to get out of here. Like I'm going to die if, I, if I'm if i still here. 
He plays it very calmly. He blinks to the car. He's crouching to LOS himself so that they have to push past the car to get him. He sees that they're starting to push past. He has another blink back up. He goes to this corner. Now again, he has a blink and a half already. And this guy for 30 seconds was able to hold on to his blinks incredibly, incredibly well. And again, insult to injury. Why is that? Why is he able to have so many blinks? Why does it feel like he's always in the fights? It's the terrain. It's where he's positioning himself. And this Tracer player ends up waiting a ton of blinks when they didn't need to. For instance, when dueling this Makui, they didn't have to use two blinks just to reach him and could have played by the stairs, table, or by the left side door using the Wrecking Ball's cover. Also note the mediocre trigger discipline, which ends up in the use of three clips just to kill a Makui whilst having the assistance of his ball player. Here's another example where our Tracer player, instead of playing by the left side cover, he swings wide and ends up taking damage, forcing out blinks and decreasing his pressure all because he couldn't play terrain. To give a different example on a different hero, his spawner going over some diva micro in a dive comp using an example of a master's diva player. When your monkey dives, this is when he needs matrix right now because that's when you're going to see stickies, that's when you're going to see sleep dart, that's when you're going to see like just random spam and you can look at it right. Shots, stickies, like th that's exactly what we're looking for, right? That needs to yep. be matrixed, okay? Once he's landed and bubbled, the only real thing that you need to worry about is nade and even then nade isn't really that big of a deal to a monkey he's not that scared of it <clears throat> so it's good to nade like eat the nade if you're inside like if you're on top of an ana you can matrix of course right but you're not on top of an ana so there's no point matrixing right now so like you said you're you're matrixing a, a literally nothing right now right there maybe um, ma maybe matrix an ana shot right there then then this is when you also flash your matrix so i like seeing like half matrix an entry a cleaner entry bubble you can selectively matrix if you see anything like really important, like the on. If you see the Ana run in the bubble, obviously you know something's up. And then on exit, you should still have like a flash of matrix left, just so that you can exit safely. So what's the solution to these issues? Well, ask yourself whether you absolutely need to use your cooldowns in the way you do. Do you need to use your shield there? Do you need to use your region burst? Do you need to toss out that repair pack on a DPS who isn't missing any HP and is likely not going to? Or in the case of Tracer, do you need to use a blink? What's the purpose behind each of your abilities? This should help you in fixing your micro mistakes and I would recommend to rewatch your replays at 0.25 or 0.5 speed to help you spot these errors. The second difference I see are mid fight rotations. Too many times I'll see masters and even high diamond players, specifically DPS and off tanks, go on autopilot and not rotate to another angle or position. Here's an example in Drunker Town first point defense. Many teams and players will get pushed back to the very end of first point and will just get rolled over, as they believe that this point is over and they end up stacking main in hopes that someone else will get the pick. Instead, there are tons of rotational options you can do which are risky, but if timed well, can result in you carrying the fight. You could rotate inside of the room with the mega, or take a slightly longer route and rotate all the way around on high ground, or push up on stairs which I would do if you're playing Sigma, or if your hero has vertical mobility Ability, climbing up the high climbing up the high ground and rotating all the way around to the other side of the map or doing a similar path by going underneath instead there's tons of options which are so underutilized and i think the reason for this is teams wait for someone to come back from spawn and by that time it's already too late to do one of these rotations so the key to fixing this is to rotate and flank early so that by the time your teammates come back from spawn you're ready to pressure from an unexpected angle the penultimate difference is the ability to do rotations cleanly. This is especially true with teams who often have a flex support lagging way behind their team and they end up getting picked off in an open kill box when their team tries to do a rotation. This is especially true with brawl comps such as Lucian Moira Winston Diva Dive or with traditional Ryan Brawl, where it's not too uncommon to see both supports or Moira and Baptiste respectively getting picked off on a rotation. The key to fixing this is twofold. The main tank is the first one in and last one out and everyone needs to be stacked and played tight on rotation. Only once have your team finished rotating can you play a bit further away on Baptiste. To go even further, you can also do a rotation bait where you double back on a rotation and this only works when the enemy team can't see you as Nata explains and gives an example of here. I'll give you an example here. Okay, the enemy team is playing over here. You decide you guys want to rotate over here. Now when you're here in this little area, this is what I like to call, like it's called a rotation bait. Now when you're in this decision, when you go here, where do they think they you're going? Think you're going to go right. Yes. but. Where can you actually go? Stairs or you can go going here, on. here, or you can also double back, right? Now, why does this work? Why does this concept work? They can't see you. <laughs> People are dumb. <laughs> they, can't, <laughs> they can't see you, True. right? And when they can't see you, they have no idea where people are going. So, you know, if you, and they sort of assume, right? They assume, hey, they're going this way, then they're probably going to go over here. That's because that's what most people do. 
The last difference, which I've used now three times, is the mechanical difference, and the difference between good versus incredible mechanics. This is especially prevalent on console, with mouse and keyboard players, or those who use a Krona Zen, and if you don't know what a Krona Zen is, it's a very complex piece of tech that allows for no recoil and a ton of aim assist of controller, and players who do use a Krona Zen or a mouse and keyboard will obviously excel above regular, normal controller players. Of course, the solution is to do some tryhard FFA or some difficult aim trainers, either with the Overwatch Workshop codes or via third party services like Kovacs. Well that's the video, if you enjoyed, don't forget to subscribe, and if this video helped to raise your IQ, be sure to share it with your friends to also raise theirs. Until next time. And I say